All right, welcome everyone. If you are here for the session called Update Your Prescription, Develop a Color-Rich Perspective, you're in the right place. Um, my name is Megan Pollock, and I'm based out of Dallas, Texas. And I'm the founder and chief inclusion engineer for my company called Engineer Inclusion. And we help organizations, people intentionally and systematically engineer equity and inclusion into their organizations, driving those positive outcomes while supporting their employees and the community. Uh, so you can learn more about my business at engineerinclusion.com or contact me at mp at engineerinclusion.com. And so today our session, this is uh, the third in our series with, with Bossier Parish. And so a lot of what we're talking about today, while it's a standalone session, it builds on what we talked about a month ago in February around unraveling bias in our brain and the neuroscience to understanding the neural networks that hold and maintain and support the prejudice and discrimination that we all hold and then what we can do about that. And so if you missed that session, we'll follow up with you on with a link that you can access that uh, recording. And then next month, we'll finish up our series on a talk called Self-Awareness for Social Justice. And we're going to use a similar agenda to how we shifted things today. So the, the example that we'll use throughout this entire talk is that of a lens, the lens in which we use to see the world and the lens in which we use to interact with the world. And so I chose the sort of example of the rose-colored glasses because um, it can sometimes sim symbolize hopefulness, but it can also symbolize uh, us not being able to see by intention. And so our goal is to update our prescription so that we can develop a color-rich perspective. The guiding questions that are going to frame our conversation today are what are systems of oppression and what is colorblind racism? We're going to really fill in the gaps there, but over the next hour, those are the two questions and uh, that I hope that you'll be able to walk away with today with a better understanding. So let's start with the rose colored glasses. So um, thanks, Sabrina, Kat, Constance, for dropping uh, your notes in the chat. Appreciate that. So what are rose? So rose tinted glasses, they make everything seem rosy. Uh, so that is red. And in an environment where everything looks red, red flags just look like flags, for example. Because they're setting, you know, sort of in this sort of metaphor is rose-colored glasses. It's to unduly to assume an unduly optimistic and cheerful attitude, or it's to focus solely or primarily on the positive aspects of something. I just listened to a two-part series of uh, Dr. Brene Brown's, I think it's her Daring to Lead podcast um, on toxic positivity. Um, and so that's very much a living life with rose colored glasses on. And so if you haven't listened to those two podcasts on Spotify, definitely recommend it. Um, it's really powerful stuff. And, and it's like watching two people have, you know, a conversation having caught up in, in ages. So I certainly recommend that. And that's like living life with this lens of not seeing anything other than that, which is what you want to see the positive. And so what happens so often when we begin to enter these conversations is that there is a perception of, of people always saying, but I'm a good person, right? And, and I want to say, yeah, you're a good person, right? We're all good people. Let's just anchor our conversation with we're all good people. And we're going to talk about some other ways in which we can look and move through this conversation outside of that, right? And so we can agree that that is something that, that describes us. But what happens is, is when we use these rose colored glasses, people often then say, I don't see color. Um, and, you know, I think about as a scuba diver, you know, I do underwater photography. And if I just take a regular camera down and take photos, um, when I, while I see everything normal down there, I see all the colors, the camera can't collect all of the colors in the light. So when you come above water, the colors in the photo um, are all like very blue and washed out. They're missing the colors. And so you, you need either a really nice camera that you can edit on the back end to sort of filter back in all the light, or you put a literal red lens over the front of your camera 
so that it allows you to capture some of those colors, right? And so, you know, if we walk around saying we don't see color because we've sort of filtered out the different light like the cameras do underneath water, what that is doing is it's refuting and denying the suffering of others. And so when we say things like, I don't see color, or I don't see race, or we live in a post-racial society, it erases their personal and cultural histories and their identities. Oh, sorry, I'm just realizing I'm using the wrong mic. So I'm getting that set, so you should be able to hear me better. OK, now the audio should be better now. Sorry about that. And so the idea of a colorblind society, um, it flourished after the civil rights movement. And so while that was well-intentioned, it leaves people without the language to discuss race and, and without being able to examine their own biases. So not having that language or the confidence to do that. And I will fully admit here, like what we're talking about today, this is stuff that I am continuously trying to learn. I was raised to be colorblind too. I grew up in Orange, Texas, um, just right on the Louisiana, Texas border. Um, and I was, my mom's family is from central Louisiana. And so um, I was, I would say that my grandparents probably fall on the, they weren't colorblind side of things, but my mom being, you know, the age that they are were sort of the post-civil rights trying to not be, you know, trying to be colorblind and not see race and to not talk about it. And so what that did is it left me crippled. One, not knowing how to talk about it. And also in the community in which I was raised in Orange, Texas, it's, it's still largely segregated and that there is a train track that separates the, you know, white families from the black and Hispanic families. And growing up, I didn't have the language to explain that, but we're going to talk about some ways um, in which we have potentially been conditioned to rationalize those kinds of things, rather than the sort of racialized structures that, that created that division, right? And so what I hope that you take out of this is that, you know, I, I, can't, I can't do the sort of work for you. I wish that I could, um, but I want to invite you on this journey with me. And so I can only help us like fumble forward together here um, and thinking about ways that we can learn. And so what that means is that we're continually engaging with black people and black culture in highly imperfect ways. And we continue to learn the language and we continue to learn more and more so that we can do more and be better. And so as we're talking about this color blindness and perpetuating that ideology, it relies on the concept that race-based differences don't matter, and it ignores the realities of systemic racism. And so we're going to be talking about systemic racism quite a bit today. And, and what happens is so many of us feel really uncomfortable talking about race. For the most part, many of us don't understand race. We don't understand racial structures. We don't understand racial ideologies. And it's because we've not had to. It's either as a function of our privilege, or we didn't learn it in schools, or we don't know what we don't know, or we've avoided learning about it as an adult. So there could be lots of reasons for why we don't know these things. But unless you've been introduced to the idea and some of the ideas that we're going to be talking about today to increase your own understanding, we could be unintentionally perpetuating some of the things uh, that sort of frameworks of colorblind racism. So what I want you to hear today from this talk, it's not about claiming to be non-racist or colorblind. It's about shifting our perspective to being anti-racist. So being an anti-racist begins with understanding the institutional nature of racial matters and accepting that all actors in a racialized society are affected materially and ideologically by the racial structure. So uh, in some of his writing, Burke says that the roots of colorblind racism, again, were largely well-intentioned. And it borrows, the ideology borrows right from the last third of Martin Luther King Jr.'s speech, where he says that he wants people to see his kids for the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And so what happens is it became quite easy for a lot of well-meaning white folks to hear that and say, well, yeah, no, I don't want, I don't want that to be the primary lens that I use to judge people's character. But what happens is that doesn't work. 
So if you were with us a couple of weeks ago um, or last month, you were part of the workshop where we talked about how the there are networks in our brain that's that withhold and maintain prejudice and discrimination and stereotypes. And that becomes the implicit bias that we all have. So we have a brain and it's it's holding all of these things in our brain. And so the idea that we just don't see color is impossible because our brain is holding um, stories against, you know, when we see one thing, it maps another thing, and that affects how we interact with others. And so if you didn't get to watch this talk um, and this workshop, we'll send you that information to, to follow along and do that. And I really recommend it because it really helps you understand what's happening in your brain. And it helps us refute that sort of, um, you know, choice to say, I'm not biased, I'm not racist, when the truth is, is these things exist in our brain and we can't function, we can't, we, we're continually, per, continuously perpetuating these things. But the good news is, through self-regulation and cognitive control, we can reduce the expression of those things. And so I'm going to start again, like I did last time with some uh, key terms, and then that will again step us into the conversation talking about systems. So the first definition is prejudice. Now prejudice, this is a preconceived opinion that's not based on reason or actual experience. Within the field of social psychology, prejudice refers more specifically to attitudes and emotional responses towards a group and its members. An application of that prejudice is discrimination. So discrimination is the unjust or prejudicial treatment of different categories of people. So people can be discriminated by race, gender, socioeconomic status, religion, sexuality, ability, age, to name a few. Then comes oppression. So oppression is the combination of prejudice and power, the combination of prejudice and power, which creates this system that then discriminates against some groups and benefits other groups. Examples of these systems are racism, sexism, heterosexism, ableism, classism, ageism, and anti-Semitism. Now, some of the key pieces of these definitions and what you'll be hearing as we go through this are dominant group and subordinate group. So a dominant group is that which holds the most power in a given society, whether you perceive you have that power or not, um, while subordinate groups are those who lack that power compared to the dominant group. So the classical sociological definition of dominant group is a group with power, privileges, and social status. And so again, you may not perceive that you as an individual have that, but if you as a body of people who share your same identities hold that power and privilege and social status, that becomes the dominant group, the dominant norms, the dominant way of knowing and doing. Now, we're gonna talk here today about systems. And so I wanna give you sort of a real world example that's outside the constructs of race, gender, class, to think about um, the thing about systems. Now, um, I know that you all in central Louisiana were also affected by the winter storms. I think Allison said that she had lost power during some part of it. Um, and I live in Texas and I live in Dallas and um, we were really affected by it. Um, and so I had several days without power, you know, it'd come on for like an hour or so here, but the worst part was the burst pipe and um, all of the subsequent flooding after that. Um, and so when we think about systems, right, like there is a system, a tremendous system with many systems that comprise that big system that led the ERCOT and our power grid to fail, right? It wasn't one thing. It wasn't one tower that came down. It wasn't one person's light bulb that they left on too long. It was the entire system acting together and, and it crumbled. And when one of the systems crumbled, it caused the next one to crumble. And that's what caused the, such the systemic issue across our state. And then when you think about how the power grid failed, and then our water system failed, right? So the water system failed because now we had bro broken pipes that were flooding and it affected all of the pressure systems. And so then people were losing water because there wasn't enough pressure for the systems to be able to, to draw the water into their places. And again, it's one system cascading to affect all of the other systems. These systems are interrelated. So that leads us to what the, we're gonna talk about a lot today is the systems of oppression. So systems of oppression enable dominant groups to exert control 
over non-dominant groups by limiting their rights, their freedom, and access to basic resources such as healthcare, education, employment, and housing. And these systems overlap and interact. And these systems are designed by people and upheld by people. There are four sources, so four types, excuse me, of oppression. Ideological, interpersonal, institutional, and internalized. So we're gonna watch a video here in a second uh, that's a, a really cute stop uh, claymation video that helps us understand these four. And then I'll recap them when we come back. But again, what I want you to think about as you watch this video and as we have this, you know, as you're learning this, is thinking about these are systems. They work together. They overlapped and interact. These systems are designed by people and upheld by people. If we go back to thinking about the power grid failure and the water systems failure, these are systems. The water system overlaps with the power grid system. They overlap. Those systems were designed by people and upheld by people. But then when other factors came into place, everything crumbled and crashed, right? So with that, we're going to watch this quick video. Let me know, pop in the chat if something happens and you can't hear it. Oppression. It's a word that's often used as a blanket term, but there's actually a whole lot more to it. There are four interlocking aspects of oppression, ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. And it might seem like a small difference, but it's very important to be able to distinguish between each kind, because understanding oppression is the first step to fighting it. Let's start with the core at the heart of every form of oppression, ideology. Every system of oppression comes from the idea that one group is somehow better than another. Ideological oppression starts when the dominant group associates positive qualities with itself and negative qualities with the marginalized or othered group. Ideological oppression describes the deeply ingrained social root of inequality. It's the larger overarching idea that leads to the isms. For example, the idea that black people are dangerous is ideological racism. The idea that poor people are lazy is ideological classism. Ideological oppression leads to institutional oppression. Institutional oppression is the way that systems and institutions manifest the dominant ideology. Institutions control access, who is able to get to what and how. This includes legal rights, police practice, access to medical care and education, public policy, political power, and media representation. For example, when women make two-thirds of what men make, that's institutional sexism. When a building is constructed without wheelchair ramps, that's institutional ableism. All of this leads to interpersonal oppression. Interpersonal oppression is probably the easiest to recognize because it happens all around us. Interpersonal oppression is the way that people play out discrimination and violence on each other. It can take the form of microaggressions, jokes, stereotypes, and harassment. For example, when a student is bullied for being gay, it's interpersonal homophobia. When a Muslim person is told that they're a terrorist, it's interpersonal Islamophobia. And all those forces, ideological, institutional, and interpersonal, lead to internalized oppression. Internalized oppression is the way that people with marginalized identities internalize narratives of their own inferiority. It's what leads people to feel less than. This is the end goal of oppression. The oppressive party doesn't need to exert force any longer because the marginalized group is enacting oppression on itself to maintain the status quo. It's important to remember that it's never a marginalized person's fault that they feel internalized oppression. It's simply what happens when someone faces negative stereotypes, low expectations, and ongoing discrimination. So, for example, an immigrant feeling embarrassed about having an accent is internalized xenophobia. When a trans woman feels that they can never be a real woman, that's internalized transphobia. So, to review, the four eyes of oppression are ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. Each of these types are interconnected and completely supported by the others. They can never exist on their own and can even be seen as a cycle. Now that you understand the different kinds of oppression, you're even more equipped to fight it. Don't forget that any effort to dismantle oppression should aim to address it at all four of these levels. Thanks for watching. All right. So, oppression. Let's, it's a word that's often used no. as a blanket term, but there's actually. Okay. Here we go. 
So I, I want to recap what she went over in the video to recap the four eyes of oppression. And um, this is just one framework for looking at and understanding the systems of oppression. There are other ways of looking at it. I like this because of the four eyes. It's easy, easier to remember. Um, but, you know, the key takeaway that she said in the end is that all of these systems overlap. They all work together. And that to really, you know, address systemic issues, we have to address all four parts of these. And so the first of the eyes is ideological. So this is the foundation of the four eyes, and it is the idea that one group is superior to another. Ideologies create a dominant narrative about a group, and it creates an us versus them culture. So examples of this would be an idea that men are smarter or more math inclined than women, that low income people do not work hard or that relationships are all between men and women. Again, these are ideological beliefs that ground all four of the systems. The second are institutional, it's inst institutional oppression. So this creates a system of invisible barriers that limit people based on their membership in social society social identity groups. So the barriers are only invisible to those who are seemingly unaffected by it. So if you, for, for many of us, if you are from the dominant culture, whether that is white, Christian, heteronormative, um, in many cases male, you don't see the barriers that others faced because the barriers aren't for you, right? There are barriers that affect other people. And so what, what our goal is today is to begin thinking about how do I adjust my lens so that I can begin to see the barriers that other people are experiencing and then do something about them. So institutional oppression occurs when established laws, customs, and practices systematically reflect and produce inequities based on one's membership in targeted social identity groups or subordinate dominant groups or target groups. Um, if oppressive consequences accrue to create institutional laws, customs, or practices, the institution is oppressive whether or not the people maintaining those practices have oppressive intentions. So again, like I said before, the system is created by people and it is upheld by people. So the system is created to get the outcomes that it gets, right? If you, I don't know if you have ever used a 3D printer or just seen how 3D printers work. 3D printers output what you program it to, con to create. It doesn't just start making things up, right? Like it's not, you know, like from the Jetsons and it just starts doing wild things. It's going to present pr print exactly what your program tells it to. When we think about our institutions, they produce the results that we have created them to produce. So if we lack the, the numbers that we desire around maybe non-traditional careers or general you know, matriculation across any dimension of identity, that's because our system is designed to create those outputs. If we modify the system to create different outputs, we will see those results differently. Now, again, it's a big system and made up of lots of different things, but unless we begin to change those laws, policies, norms, and practices, it will continue to be oppressive whether or not we believe it to be or not. Again, examples of institutional oppression are laws, education, media, public policies, uh, gender pay gap is an institutionalized sexism. The school to prison pipeline is an is institutional racism. And our public school system maintains structural inequality through such practices such as tracking of students, our standardized tests, and teaching in a teaching force that does not represent the diversity of its student body. The next eye of the four eyes is interpersonal. So generally, this is where people kind of get stuck. They think when they hear the word racism or sexism, they think it's just about what happens between you and me or you and somebody else. This is one part of a much bigger system of oppression, right? You've got all four of these to think about, but this is where so many people get really hung up. And so interpersonal interactions, these are how ideas are played out in our daily interactions, whether unintentional or not. It could include our implicit bias, our micro messages, 
perpetuating or not challenging, not interrupting stereotypes, not recognizing our own power and our privilege or claiming reverse racism or oppression. And so this interpersonal is what's again happening between you and another, or maybe you and sort of a small group of other people, but it's just one big one part of a big system. This one is usually the most obvious because it's, it's between one another. Uh, we may not see the barriers that exist in the institutional and the ideological beliefs are so deeply embedded in our ways of knowing and doing that we don't even recognize them as ideological beliefs. Uh, examples of interpersonal interactions are like getting catcalled on the street, um, not making sure that spaces for events are accessible, or laughing at jokes that are racist or xenophobic. And the last of the four eyes is internalized. So big, big asterisk here is that oppression always, always begins from the outside of the oppressed group. But by the time it gets internalized, the external oppression need hardly be felt for the damage to be done. And so if people from the oppressed group feel badly about themselves and because of the nature of the system, they don't have the power to direct those feelings back towards the dominant group without receiving more blows, then there are only two places to dump those feelings on oneself and on the people in the same group. So examples of this may be feelings of self-hate, believing negative messaging, powerlessness, or despair. And so again, wrapping up the, the four eyes here before we shift gears to the to really examining what colorblind racism looks like. When we say we don't see race, when we say we don't see color, it denies systemic racism. It denies that all these four exist and that they work together to affect others. Now, again, we've got a video here on the next. It's, uh, I think, about six minutes, and it teaches us about what is colorblind racism and introduces the, the core framework for looking at how that manifests in our interactions. What is colorblind racism? Before we get to that, let's look at racism. In the United States today, African Americans have about 10 cents for every dollar of wealth that whites have. African Americans are also overrepresented in the prison system. They're seven times as likely as whites to be incarcerated for drug offenses even though blacks and whites use and sell drugs at exactly the same rates. Although the United States is a racially unequal society, very few people admit to being racist. How is it possible to have widespread racial inequality in a society with no racist? How do we have racism without racists. Eduardo Bonilla Silva argues we no longer have Jim Crow racism. During the Jim Crow era, African Americans were denied access to schools, places of business, and even water fountains designated for whites. Today, it is illegal to discriminate based on race, However, racial inequality persists. We have moved from Jim Crow racism to colorblind racism. Colorblind racism is a racial ideology that rationalizes racial inequality using non-racial language. For example, how would you explain the fact that many cities still have segregated schools and neighborhoods, even though there are no laws that prevent African Americans from moving into predominantly white neighborhoods, there continue to be neighborhoods that have few to no black residents. School segregation also persists, despite the absence of laws that mandate it. In Washington, D.C., for example, 71% of black students attend schools that have no white students. If you ask a person on the streets to explain why schools and neighborhoods are segregated by race, they might say that African-Americans prefer to live with their own kind 
or that there's nothing that prevents Latinos from leaving ethnic neighborhoods. This is a form of colorblind racism because it uses liberal ideas such as freedom of choice to explain racial inequality while ignoring the factors that create and perpetuate segregation. You see, studies show that although most whites prefer neighborhoods that are all or mostly white, very few black people prefer black neighborhoods. This is borne out by the fact that if large numbers of African Americans move into a white neighborhood, whites will leave in droves. Black families are also often unable to afford houses in wealthy white neighborhoods due to the fact that black families have only a tenth of the wealth white families have. Another explanation you might hear for racial segregation is that people just like to be around others like them. This is called naturalization, where people explain racial dynamics as natural or normal, again, ignoring the structural factors that created segregation. You might also hear someone say that African Americans live in poor neighborhoods because they don't work hard enough to afford to move out. This frame is called cultural racism because it blames racial disparities on supposed cultural differences. Another thing you might hear is minimization of racism. When whites will say that discrimination doesn't play a role in creating racial inequality because those people aren't racist. Notably, black people generally believe that discrimination is widespread, whereas many whites claim it's not. Eduardo Bonilla Silva argues that white people use rhetorical strategies to express racist ideas without being labeled as racist. Bonilla Silva argues that today's racial norms do not permit the overt expression of racist views. Thus, whites have developed concealed ways of expressing racist views and reproducing racial inequality. For example, when researchers ask white respondents if they would mind if their daughter married a black man, they responded by saying things like, I'm not a racist, but I don't think interracial marriages work. Or they might say, I don't mind if my daughter marries a black man, but you have to think about the children. These rhetorical strategies allow whites to indirectly express discriminatory or prejudiced ideas without appearing to be racist. Bonilla Silva found that people use colorblind racial ideology to justify racial inequality. Colorblind ideology allows whites to explain why racial inequality is not due to racism. In addition to rationalizing racial inequality, colorblind racism reproduces racial inequality by permitting people to engage in discriminatory actions without being labeled racist. This is how we have racism without What is colorblind racism? What is colorblind racism? <laughs> okay, it's like I've never done this before. Uh, so the last thing that she was saying is how do we have racism without racists? And so what she was talking about in this video was the work of Dr. Eduardo Bonilla Silva, a Puerto Rican researcher, and he conducted some empirical research studies to analyze the types of dialogue and arguments created by people to indirectly and subtly justify racial inequality. And so again, this is from his groundbreaking breaking study that was released in 2003 um, in his book called Racism Without Racists. He's had multiple editions that have, that have come back out. And so uh, this is what his book looks like. And I want to tell you a little bit about the methodology of the study and then uh, some of the, the findings that came out of that that gives another framework for looking at this. And the framework is the, the four frames of, of colorblind racism. So he, he did both, a, he did a mixed method study. He started with a survey, but you know, found that in doing a survey, 
asking people about things of this nature that people tended to sort of answer the right answer, right? And they didn't answer necessarily truthfully. And so he wanted to follow up with some in-depth interviews to ask more questions and get more nuanced responses. And he wanted to get the language that people were using. So um, I'm not sure the exact methodology because he doesn't write about it in his book, but I'm assuming he uses used some grounded theory and uh, and analyzing the data from those interviews. And what he had is he had two bodies of of people who who did the interviews with him, and they were about an hour each interviews. And so the first group were 41 students who completed the survey, volunteered to be interviewed. And what that looked like, they're from a Midwestern university, 17 men, 24 women, 31 were from middle and upper class backgrounds, 10 were from the working class. And then there was another body that, um, of people that he studied and they were not students, but they were from a Detroit area study. And there were 84 people that he interviewed in their homes and there were 66 white people and 17 black. Now, this his work has been replicated and or in some ways and produced similar results by other researchers but i don't i what i want you to hear in this is this gives us a way of thinking about how people talk about um in ways that we justify racial inequality um and so we again we're not trying to argue the, the pros and cons of, of of qualitative research um, and we're not making broad generalizations. It's just helping us to put some language and understanding around this. And the purpose of his book was not to demonize whites or to label them racist. And his work wasn't a measure of how good of a person you are. His goal was to uncover the collective practices in, in this instance, the ideological ones that help reinforce the contemporary racial order. So the analytical issue was examining how many whites subscribe to an ideology that ultimately helps preserve racial inequality rather than assessing how many hate or love blacks or other minorities. So again, it's looking to examine the ways in which white people may be upholding these uh, racially, racial systemic inequities um, and maybe not know it and how that language is perpetuating the ideas of the contemporary racial order. So there are four frames, as he calls them, and the central framework for colorblind racism. And as you saw in the video, the sort of split between Jim Crow and then after the civil rights movement. So from the late 1800s to the mid 1960s, the system of racial segregation and oppression known as the Jim Crow made it illegal for black Americans to have the same social and economic rights as whites, as white Americans. And then after the civil rights movement of the 60s brought some positive change, those people who weren't directly impacted in the years that followed, such as those in suburban white communities, could easily choose to believe that America's big ugly racist period was a thing of the past, right? Because they didn't have to face it or think about it. That was easy for them to think it was just over. And that's what brings us to the four frames. But before I, I talk about each of the four frames, I want to give you some, some definitions to kind of ground the conversation. The first is the definition of race. So race is a socially constructed category. This means that the notions of racial difference are human creations rather than eternal essential categories. As such, racial categories have a history and are subject to change. The concept of race has changed across cultures and eras and has eventually become less connected with ancestral and familial ties and more concerned with superficial physical characteristics. As an example, um, if you've not ever looked and studied the sort of history of race in America, um, what, what we now call you know, people who are white is very different than people who we considered white um, you know, even as early as the, the night is 1900 right so the irish immigrants and italian immigrants though those populations were not considered white in the beginning because they were more you know tied to their ancestral and familial ties uh, initially but the point is is that race the construct of race and how we perceive it has meshed and morphed over time particularly as we created the true dichotomy of black and white. 
And so in the past, theorists have posited categories of race based on those various geographic regions, ethnicities, skin colors, and more. And their labels for racial groups have connoted regions or skin tones. It's really important to note that the prominent social science organizations, including American Association of Anthropologists, the American Sociological Association, and the American Psychological Association have all, all taken official position rejecting the biological explanations of race. So over time, the typology of race that developed during early racial science has fallen into disuse and the social construction of race is a more sociological way of understanding the racial categories. Now, even though I've defined race here as what it is, a construct, it doesn't mean it, it has no effect on people, right? So social categories such as race, class, and gender, they all have a social reality producing real effects on the actors. So we have race and these race, the race that we have becomes these racial structures. So when race emerged in human history, it formed a social structure. It was a racialized social system that awarded systemic privileges to Europeans, the people who later became white over non-Europeans, people who later became non-white. And these racialized social systems or white supremacy for short, became global and affected all societies where Europeans extended their reach. A society's racial structure is the totality of the social relations and practices that reinforce white privilege. So we wanna ask, right? Like why are racial structures reproduced in the first place? Wouldn't we want as good people uh, after discovering this folly of racial thinking want to work to abolish race as a category as well as a practice? Well, racial structures remain in place for the same reasons that other structures do. Since actors racialized as white or as members of the dominant ra race receive material benefits from that racial order, they struggle to maintain their privileges. So in contrast, those people who are defined as belonging to the subordinate race or racial or races struggle to change that status quo. So in conclusion of racial structure, racial structures and racial inequality exist because they benefit members of the dominant race. And, and how we can become unintentionally complicit in this is recognizing that we may not know the way in which we benefit from these systems, and we may not know the ways in which we are unintentionally upholding these systems. That's what this lesson and all, you know, the future learning that you will do will help us begin to recognize. And so the next key piece of this before we look at the four frames is racial ideology. And racial ideology is the racially based frameworks used by actors to explain and justify or challenge the racial status quo. So it's how we define race and the ideology and belief system around that. So first of the frames is abstract liberalism. Abstract liberalism is considered the most important frame by Benilla Silva because it forms the foundation of colorblindness. It is explaining racial matters in an abstract decontextualized manner. Abstract liberalism boils down to every individual having political liberalism and economic liberalism. So having political liberalism means that equal opportunities are available to everyone. And that is a belief that many people hold. And especially we see that in education, that there is, you know, equal opportunity to do this. And, and, and that's not always the case, right? Like it's saying everybody has equal access, but when we think about the fact that there might be barriers between what I'm trying to do and what you're trying to do and what somebody else is trying to do, that's not, that's, it's diminishing again, the, the, the systemic issues that people are facing. And so when, or, when minorities are perceived to be given an advantage when it's related to abstract liberalism, no matter how small, this advantage is seen as unfair by others. So we see this manifested in affirmative action, you know, people see that as unfair, um, even though it's just trying to give people more seats at the table. So the key belief here 
the key belief of abstract liberalism is that equal opportunities are available. The question comes down to choice and choice defines why not everyone is equal. So the next of the four frames is naturalism. Naturalism or naturalization is the mindset that racism happens naturally or that racial friction happens because it can't be avoided. In a way, it enables whites to see racial friction problems as just the way it is, right? It's the status quo, it's how things are, it's the way it's always been. And so a structural problem that occurs because of this mindset is the tendency to gravitate to one's own racial group. A tendency to gravitate to people that are like us is seen as being natural, even if this goes against the colorblind ideal. So it's naturalizing racialized outcomes such as neighborhood segregation. And so the belief here is that differences and racial tensions just happen naturally because that's the way that the system works. Everything is meant to work a certain way naturally, right? So again, this is how we're justifying racial inequality. And I don't know about you, but when I, when I read this, when I read the book by Eduardo uh, Benito Silva, it's like stabbing me in the heart, like every page turn of like, ah, I've said that, oh my gosh, I've thought that. And I didn't even know that I was rationalizing, you know, racial inequality in this kind of way. And so I hope that you're sort of feeling some prick points here as well and thinking about ways that you can begin to avoid this kind of uh, rationalization that is uh, reinforcing colorblind racism. So the next of the frames is cultural racism. So cultural racism is used to try to explain why certain groups are not able to overcome obstacles to get out of their current life situations. Whether that be the like poverty or lack of education. It's attributing racial differences to cultural practices. So the key practice or the key belief or practice here is it's referencing or it's the referencing or blaming the culture or the racial group that someone belongs to as being the reason for why minoritized groups continue to be where they are. And the last of the four frames is the minimization of racism. So I, I think the title of this one really sums the stage up, but um, racism here is seen as not affecting the choices and life chances of minoritized groups. So when minoritized groups bring up that racism and discrimination are still present in a substantial way in their lives, whites have a tendency who are, are people who minimize race, whites have a tendency to see them as playing the race card. Um, there was a news somebody forwarded it to me a few weeks ago, uh, a news broadcaster on a channel that I don't listen to. I don't watch live news anyways, but um, the person said like, systemic racism doesn't exist because if it existed, black people wouldn't still be moving to our country. And that is absolutely the minimization of racism. And so it's, it's the belief that racism and discrimination no longer exist because they're not as bad as in the past. So if they're not as bad there in the past, they must not have an effect on the life choices of minoritized groups, right? And so again, just because it's not as bad as it was in the past doesn't mean it still doesn't exist. Um, and so again, this is the fourth frame of a colorblind framework. Now I want to then move us towards thinking about strategies. What can we do? Um, and then we'll open it up for discussion and questions. So the first of the strategy is we got to do the work. We need to continue to self-examine and to look inside ourselves and to think about the ways in which we are perpetuating um, colorblind racism, the way in which we are learning to understand the construct of race, the, the impacts of systemic oppression at all the four levels of the four eyes. Um, we have to not only continue learning about our own history and how our history affects how we interact with others, um, but we've got to reflect and learn from that. Um, as I've said throughout, like this is my journey too. I, again, having been raised in the family I was raised in in Southeast Texas, um, I was not raised to talk about race. I was, I was um, 
not raised to be comfortable around it, not raised to have any language around it. And so it's been an, a journey of learning to understand not only like how do I learn to talk about it and how do I learn to, to move forward and to contribute to progress, but also like understanding the impact of living in that environment for so long, right? So again, if you think back to what we talked about, the neuroscience of the brain, my brain essentially had been deep wired with all of those prejudice and stereotypes and discriminatory sort of practices from my upbringing. And while I can't necessarily erase that from my brain, I can use, you know, self-regulation and cognitive control to minimize the way that those manifest in my interactions. And that takes work. And it's work that is meaningful to me and it's work that I am committed to doing. Do I mess up? Yes. Do I make, am I perfect? By no means. Am I still fumbling through a lot of this? Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, even teaching this lesson was incredibly scary to me because I've never taught this much content about race, even within a short time. I've taught the frameworks in different settings. Uh, but again, it's helping ourselves be more comfortable through the self-examination and practice. The next two go together. So we have to learn to listen when other people share their stories. And then the flip side of that is you got to believe them because so often we don't listen when people share their experiences. One, they don't owe us their stories, but if they tell us their story, we should listen. But then most importantly, we must believe them because what happens too often is that we minimize them and their experience to maintain our comfort. Like I'm uncomfortable with you talking about this. So like it couldn't be, an, it couldn't have been that big a deal. Like let's just move on. So now you no longer, you don't believe them. You're not listening to them. Now you have literally dismissed them. And then whatever it is that they'd experience and believe someone when they tell you what's happened. It doesn't benefit you to argue it, right? Like what seems, if, if there's no, if there's no a pressure on you from the oppression, oppression on you in that instance, and someone who is being oppressed tells you a story and you deny them, you are literally just doubling down on the oppression that they, that person has experienced. The next one, and I, this kind of really ties to what I said with the first one, is you got to learn, right? Like, listen to podcasts, read books, watch films, um, you know, follow people on Twitter who are thought leaders, you know, that you want to, to learn from, um, or however you gain news, try to learn about the experiences of people who are different than you. Um, Code Switch by NPR is a really fantastic podcast. Um, that I recommend. They, it's, it's really informative. Um, even watching shows like Blackish and Mixedish and um, Fresh Off the Boat, those are comedy shows, but they're actually teaching you a lot about race and America. And, um, and so those are good ways to learn um, about things as, as well. Uh, if you, if anything that I talked about today was new to you about understanding the concept of race, like it's okay, you're not alone, right? Like I didn't really learn about these constructs until I was in grad school. And so it takes the being challenged and introduced to these things to really dig into them. Please don't ask a person of color to explain things to you or expect them to soothe any guilt that you may be feeling. I think that particularly in the last year, um, many people of color, particularly black people um, are just utterly overwhelmed by the amount of white people in their life coming and saying like, oh my God, I didn't understand like racism was on the thing. Like it didn't exist before the George Floyd murder. And there is a burden that that person has to carry to like try to teach you. Sometimes they want to do it if they like you or love you or you know if you're important to them. But be really wary that that person is carrying a lot of burden of helping a lot of people learn things. And so, um, so be wary of that. And then if you are experiencing any kind of guilt, please don't expect them to make you feel better about that. If you've not read the book, White Fragility, whether you're white or not, it's a great book to, to really tap into that point. And the last key strategy here is to buddy up with a non-person of color to learn together so that you can check in with them and to, uh, to help one another grow and learn in this. And so that you're not having to lean on your, uh, your friends who are colleagues who are people of color and putting the onus on them to be your teachers. It's not their job. 
Um, there is lots of information out there that we can learn and grow together. Uh, I'll leave you with this quote before we go to questions. Um, this is uh, something Janetta Sagan wrote uh, years ago. And she wrote, silence in the face of injustice is complicity with the oppressor. And what we often hear it shortened as is silence is complicity. And so what this means to me is if I don't see something, if I don't say something, if I don't do something and change the systems of oppression that are all around me, I am complicit in the oppression of people. And I don't know about you, but I don't wanna be that person. And so it takes continuous learning for me and sometimes I'm failing and sometimes I'm doing it wrong, but I want to be the person who is, is doing something. And so I encourage you to take some of those strategies, uh, but the main takeaway is to just keep learning and asking questions. Uh, who is this benefiting? Who is this not serving? And what can you do differently? Uh, so we've got about 30 minutes set aside for questions and discussion. And so let's start now. Let me just open the floor to you all. What questions do you have for me? You can turn on your mic or you can drop it in the chat. I have one question. Um, you mentioned about it and catch it. You mentioned the podcast, the Code Switch podcast. Who was it by? Who's it's an NPR it? um, pod, NPR podcast. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, the Thank another you. NPR podcast, Hidden Brain. They also talk about some some of the implications, the neuroscience of how this functions in our brain. So some of those sessions are good, but Code Switch just talks about some of the good, great stories and, you know, connections to what's happening in our world. What other questions do you have? Um, oh, Kat Williamson has a chat. Yeah, the book, How to Be Anti-Racist. Yes, it is fantastic. Um, and if, if you don't um, have time to sit and read, you can listen to the, the audio book of that. And uh, he's certainly been on lots of podcasts, over, particularly over the last year. Uh, so there are lots of ways to consume that information from him. Okay, Kat says, when you stumble through being an anti-racist, what advice do you give to yourself to improve? I think it's tempting to try to minimize your mistake instead of facing it. So I, I like your language of stumble through because I feel like that's really accurate um, for many of us who are trying to make up a lot of ground, you know, really fast and, and our knowledge. Um, the first advice I would give to you is to give yourself a little grace um, and first celebrate when you have learned that you've stumbled, right? Like acknowledging a mistake is really the first step, like to build the lens and to be able to see when you may have done something that wasn't ideal. Um, that's really part of the process. And if you, if we batter ourselves every time we mess up, like that's, that's like bad psychological theory of like, you know, motivation, right? We, we want to help ourselves be successful. And so um, I think, you know, give yourself some grace. I think be as honest and authentic and transparent about it as possible. I, whether it's right or not, this is what I try to do in my teaching. I try to be honest and transparent and authentic that I stumble through this journey as well. Because if we don't model it as it is in reality, it could create some kind of image that like, come on, get with it. Why aren't you done yet? Like it's, you're never done, right? Like you have to continue to learn. And today we talked a lot about, you know, um, anti-racism and it sort of leaned more towards, uh, towards black and, and African Americans. But, you know, we see so much has happened in the last year with, with racism around Asians and Asian Americans. 
And so, and the same with Hispanic people. And, you know, like racism is much more complex than just one, one simple, you know, or one single race, not simple, excuse me, um, that we have to learn how to address so many of the challenges, the stereotypes and the prejudice that, that we hold throughout all of them. And so again, you know, Kat, I think you're asking a great question of, of the advice is just to be kind to yourself, but don't dismiss what you've done. If you've done something that you need to correct, hold yourself accountable to that, right? Like, because we're still dealing with other humans and we want to be cognizant of their feelings and we're still trying to create inclusive learning environments, inclusive work environments uh, for everyone around us. Hopefully that was helpful. Yeah. I also think here, um, the sort of buddy system is really useful. So it gives you someone that you can call and be like, oh my God, you're not gonna believe what I just did. I'm so, you know, insert emotions. And it gives you a sort of outlet to, to process those things. So community is really good there as well. Megan, uh, my name is Kelly McDade. I'm in the liberal arts division of the college. And uh, I also grew up in Texas and I also am shocked on a regular basis of how much I did not learn as well. And I supposedly went to one of those, you know, classically, whatever, right? It's just so Western focused, it's myopic. So I uh, just wanted to say, I recognize that with you. Um, I've been trying my best to educate myself, especially over the pandemic quarantine period. And um, I'm just, I, I don't know, I, you know, the more you find out, it's, it can be overwhelming. And I guess I'm questioning, like, what um, do you have just immediate, how can we affect change um, immediately? Um, or what, you know, what are some things that you've found that, that are able to, uh, you know, communicate clearly what it is that we want to do in breaking down these barriers and um, recognizing privilege and, and helping um, both our students and our fellow colleagues. Yeah, thanks for asking that, Kelly. You know, I wish that there was like a magical set of goggles we could pick up and it just helped us see the entire world differently, but it's a gradual, it's a gradual thing, right? There's no switch that we can give that, that's, that helps us all of a sudden see the experiences of other people through a different light. And so I, I think that the first thing to do is recognize that it is a journey, right? And I had a, a really trusted colleague of mine as early on in my sort of racial equity journey um, I expressed something that I had done that I was upset about. Like I didn't catch it soon enough. And she said, I want to give you permission to first celebrate that you recognize it. Like that's really the first thing. And then next time, maybe you'll recognize it sooner and be able to act on it. And so first give yourself some grace in this journey and recognizing that, yeah, there's a million books that you can read. But you, you can't read them all at once and you can't absorb all of them at once. But as long as you continue to learn, what I think is important is for every person in their sphere of influence. Uh, if you're familiar with Stephen Covey's, because sometimes they're called circles of influence or spheres of influence, to recognize what you can control and what you can influence. And that's different for all of us. So if you have control over policies, if you have control over programs, if you have control over whatever the things that you have control over, how are you use, using an anti-racist lens? How are you using an educational equity lens to examine who that's serving, right? And so the question that you can just ask is like, who's not being served by this insert XYZ that we're creating? Who is being served? Who is getting a privilege in this and who is not receiving that privilege? And so the first thing is make that a really central question that you ask every single time. Another thing that I think we can do as educators is in how we look at our data. If you aren't disaggregate, disaggregating, especially if you all are in CTE pathways, if you're not disaggregating by gender and race every time you collect data, in my opinion, your data is worthless. 
because you can't understand who it's affecting unless you're able to disaggregate and look at the different groups that are being served. Um, so again, disaggregating by data. And then my, my last tip for you is avoid Facebook, right? Like Facebook proselytizing will beat anyone down. So like, don't let your ability to convince everyone that you grew up with on Facebook be your measure of success because it is a terrible measure of success. Done. I've already disengaged, have been disengaged, am a much happier, much more reasonable person having done so. Um, let, let me, can I follow up really quickly about, because I'm a teacher, and so my sphere of influence obviously is my classroom, and I have attempted to adjust and uh, revise my um, curriculum to incorporate uh, I teach art, and so, um, you know, really focusing primarily on um, artists of color. Also, um, you know, investigating uh, people who are using art as an, a tool to address um, racism and injustice, social injustice, and things of that nature. And, you know, one of the things that I keep running up against, and it's so difficult for me, especially because we've been uh, largely online is the um, technological disparity. And it, it's, not, it's not just a, a race issue, you know, it's certainly a class issue in many ways, but I don't, you know, because there's this effort and there's this interest in moving more and more towards even OER materials, which would, you know, save people money from buying a book, but there's this effort and there's this push to, make everything available online when that's not really helpful to many of my students and you know we value um i mean i need them to communicate to me but frankly many of them can speak much better than they can write and but i mean you know there's so much to be addressed it's difficult um to figure out what's a reasonable thing to do and what's uh, you know um going overboard, I guess. So anyway, that was a jumble of thought, Megan, but if you can. <laughs> I certainly don't have the answer to should we go all digital or not? I mean, the answer is generally who does it serve, right? Like who does it serve and who doesn't it serve? And it sounds like you asked that, that you're asking that question. And if you don't have control over the university or community college policy to make that transition, to be an equitable educator, the question is, is what are you going to do to support those students who don't have access to that? That's how you begin to add additional supports to that system to fill in the gaps to make sure that the students who don't have access or um, uh, to those different materials that, that you can provide that for them. So you're asking the right questions. And for everyone's context, you're going to have a different answer. I love that you're bringing in, you know, people of color into your into your lessons. That's really critical. Um, I think teaching your students to have a critical lens and looking at um, not looking at art from a critical lens, but critical lens of examining the ways in which art has has privileged certain groups of people and not others, right? And, and how has that potentially influenced art today and what we decide is good art and what we decide is bad art, right? Mm -hmm. Those are critical lenses that you get to teach and you don't have to have the answers, right? Like our students are smart. If okay. you create an opportunity for them to have that conversation and develop that critical thinking lens, uh, that's a really beneficial thing to them and to mm -hmm. our future as well. Thank you. reading Matthew's comment. He says, thank you for sharing that there's absolutely no basis for race in the nature biological world. It's purely a human made idea. I think that there are many that do not really think about that. The good thing with acknowledging that fact is that there is a way forward. If we created it, we can get rid of it. Of course, this will not be easy, but it is possible. I love your hope. Yes. What else? Other questions, comments? One thing I heard recently was the idea of any hierarchy is really normalizing um, uh, supremacy, you know, whether that's gender supremacy or, you know, um, sexual orientation or racism and things like that. And so, 
it's very interesting. I remember when I first started teaching and I'm kind of late to the game, you know, the idea was instead of being the sage on the stage, right, you're the guide on the side kind of thing. And, um, you know, the idea of escaping the, you know, hierarchy, I mean, what is a teacher student relationship except hierarchical, but at the same time, I think it's really an interesting concept to use a more investigative um, uh, model for a, a, a classroom community. And so that, you know, questions are being raised from all areas of the classroom. And we as a community are investigating those questions together. And, you know, that's one thing I've thought perhaps might um, do it. I mean, ultimately, it's hard because I think so many kids and students have been beaten into you know, the grade idea, like I have to make a certain grade or I'm going to lose my financial aid or I'm not, I'm not going to get into nursing school and whatever. And so, you know, their idea is how do I get an A? How do I get an A? Not how do I learn to think? And it's really difficult because on the one hand, I want to reward them anyway. It, it just becomes a strange thing because I'm still required to provide grades, right? But at the same time, um, I guess how I award those is, is my purview. So maybe that's where I have the power to address that. Yeah, so you bring up a couple of good points. So one is that we have power over how we grade and how we grade can often unintentionally perpetuate individualistic ways of knowing and doing. So if you look at Hofstede's um, contrasting values framework, um, you can perpetuate a single way of knowing and doing, and that prioritizes it and values it more highly. If we want to be culturally responsive and equitable educators, we're looking at ways to incorporate both collectivist and individualistic ways of knowing and doing both in our, in our activities and in the way in which we grade, grade our students. Um, and again, that takes practice, right? It's learning the frameworks and learning how to have a different perspective. I was raised in the most individualistic way possible. Like I was raised to be super competitive, perfectionist, like you go do all these things to earn and do by yourself. And, but yet my, my value system is much more on a collectivist. So I have to recognize that my MO, like the way that my brain has big, essentially been wired over the type of my life is to function in this. So I have to stop and say like, yeah, but how do I really want to do this to honor multiple ways of knowing and doing? And that's a practice. It's a, a practice of stopping and thinking. Um, and the other thing that you said is about hierarchy having the potential to reinforce um, patriarchy, white supremacy, all kinds of things. And, and while the answer isn't necessarily to throw out all structures, to me, the answer to that is a spirit of, it's, it's, it's your perception, right? So if I manage a team, it's my job to manage the direction of that team. But if I treat everyone on my team as my equal, then it's really not a hierarchy, right? It's just a structure to help us move forward, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you as a leader sort of put on your, you know, had of of thinking you have more power you're more important um then that is reinforcing those structures to me like to not to be a non-hierarchical leader that reinforces those structures is modeled in like servant leadership the kinds of leaders that will get down on their hands and knees to do the dirty work if it needs to be done rather than saying you know you get down there and do that right because by not doing that you're saying I'm too important for this someone else has to do that and that certainly reinforces those structures and so this is just a, a personal way of living like do I want to be a person who thinks I'm more important than others or do I want to treat everyone as equals um, and not reinforce those structures can you share the Hofstede's framework? What, what is that again? Yeah, I actually have a link on my website. Let me find it. Um, or I, I can go find it. Go on. It's, uh, so if you Google like uh, contrast, contrasting values framework, um, it should come up. Um, I'll find a link here on my website. I have a handout that you can download that. Thank you. I think I, I, think I do. 
Thank you. Or it's on my to-do list to finish it. But um, that's a really great practice. There is a website. If you Google the terms contrasting values, Native American education, I think it's one of the top things that comes up. And it's a really uh, powerful perspective of, of looking at how does it show up in education. It's certainly from a Native American standpoint, but you can extrapolate that to, to different cultures as well. Um, Thank you. Dr. Pollock, are you familiar with uh, Yava Blay? No. She's, um, I just uh, am getting uh, familiar with her, but anyway, she created a book called uh, One Drop, Shifting the Lens on Race. And um, there was a conversation, she was on a podcast recently, and she just really made an excellent point of, you know, what needs to be remembered is that the way we are going about racial equity and justice at this point is to both condemn and to, cons to consider the black, um, generally speaking, the, um, the, the victim and also the savior of the system. So not only are they being condemned by the system, but they're being asked to tell us white people how to fix the system and what a double um, punishment that is and how unfair that is. And so what I found so interesting, she said, this is, this is white people's work. This is, um, you know, and I really, yeah, you know, it's not, I guess I just heard it for the first time in a way that I thought, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense, right? Yeah, I, it's, I, I hear what you're saying and, and I, it is all of us, it is all of our responsibility to contribute to this work. I think that there is, there has become a, a weird shift in, in my field around diversity, equity, and inclusion to an unfortunate belief system that says only, you know, black women scholars can do this work. And while I wholeheartedly have a team of awesome black women scholars that I work with and I actively work to support them, by saying that only one group of people can do that work, it actually reinforces white supremacy in and of itself, right? You know, it is the responsibility of all of us to do this work. And, and what could happen if we, if we perpetuate the, it's your job, it's your job, is it, it gives somebody a buy. It gives somebody the chance to just sit back and say like, yeah, you know, it's not my job, I'll get that. It is our job. And is it our job as educators, whether you believe you signed up to do this or not, you, I don't think that there's some oath that educators take, but if there were an oath, it would be to serve every student and to serve every student equitably. And to do that, we have to practice equitable things in our classroom. And that means practicing anti-racist behaviors. And that means changing ourselves and, our, and developing our own lens and practice to begin to do that. Um, and so, it is the job of all of us. Yeah. Right. And I don't, yeah, I didn't mean to suggest, it was just an interesting thing. She was talking about how exhausting it is to be both. Um, I, yeah, I mean, it's been fascinating to me to sort of watch LinkedIn bubble over the last year of like um, so many awesome Black women I know now have the title with their other job of like diversity chair, this, that, or the other. And while if that's what they want to do, that's awesome. But I also feel the pain of now they're having to do two jobs and that's not fair to them either. Um, and they took the job because the, the new role because they care about it and they want to make change. But in most cases, they're not being compensated for that work differently. They're not given the support that they need. Um, and so if that's happening in your environment, go talk to them and say, what can I do? We're gonna work on this together and so make sure that they really do have the support of everyone moving in that direction. So Kelly, hopefully, hopefully you saw the link in the chat to the contrasting values framework. Yes, I do, thank you very much. And those um, are just some of the dimensions of the values. There are more dimensions that are in, than are in those tables. Um, that's just some of them. Can I ask a, a stupid question? No question, stupid. So Anyone? when you talk about desegregating by gender and race, is that? D disaggregating. Is that, hmm? Disaggregating. 
Disaggregating, thank you. Um, is that just something as simple as when I'm looking into my, you know, online coursework that it's there and I can do that easily or, or do I have, I have to parse that myself. I'm sorry. Silly well, question. I don't know your systems, but typically for every line of student data that you have, you should have at least their gender and race. And so when you sort of pull a report, instead of just pulling a list of your students and whatever else, pull, you know, student and gender and race. And then to disaggregate, that means to look at the data through the lens of those different trend lines. Mm -hmm. So like right now I'm building a data table for, um, for South Carolina and um, for their technical colleges. And, you know, had, they had to pull all of their CTE data by each student and they had to include race and gender because what I want them to be able to do in this data table is to look and see who's being served and who's not being served. Because you could look at it and say, ah, oh, women are being served. But then if you look at it and say, okay, well, not Hispanic women and not black women, they're dropping out at higher rates. That tells you something, right? And then you can make, take some action on that. But if you just look at it, you know, through one lens of saying, oh, students are doing fine without disaggregating by gender. I mean, that's really how all the Perkins money, accountability money around this exists, right? Is it started disaggregating by gender and saying women aren't participating in these things, men aren't participating in these things. But then we have to take it one step further and disaggregate by race to really understand the sort of intersections of identities. Most places don't have very good data to disaggregate by other things like SES or special populations. Um, and most of the data sets that I come across, they're woefully incomplete or they're self-reported and, and so they're inaccurate. Um, but the richer the data that you can have and your ability to, dis to disaggregate by more dimensions helps you see different trends. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, well, Allison, at some point, I'm going to ask you about that <laughs> to, to know more. Thank you. We've got, you know, eight more minutes or so. So as a dis sort of discussion topic, I'm interested to know, um, maybe report out of what stood out to you the most, what's something that you learned or something that you're going to take away and reflect on um, or study takeaways, something that you want to reflect on and learn more about. Megan, it's Allison. I think in, in a nutshell for me in developing professional development, um, it's, I think what you said about who is being served and who is being left out, that just is, you know, that's low hanging fruit for me. I can, I can figure that out pretty quickly. I know who my audience is and I know who I'm not serving or who, who's not engaging. So I appreciate that. I mean, there's so many, all of this was so good and rich. I can't wait to hear it again because <laughs> I really need to internalize so much of this. And I hope also that uh, you will consider uh, providing some recorded segments of this that we can put up on the site for others. Yes, who need I did. Review. I did record this one. Hopefully the next one's better. But, uh, <laughs> we'll this was great. Time. Thanks. Good. And I'll admit, like, I was, I don't get nervous teaching um, because I've been doing it so long. I've been super nervous about teaching this. Um, I've taught about the things separately, but never having a single conversation about this. And I tell you that because that's part of my own conditioning, the fear of talking about race. And that's part of, you know, why I'm choosing to do this work because um, it's incredibly important. And even if it makes us uncomfortable to begin to make change, we have, we can no longer be silent. You know, it, we have to help others learn and grow and, and move forward in their own understanding of, of their racial identities and the way in which we uphold these systems unintentionally. Thanks, Allison. Any other takeaways? Something you want to share? Yeah, this is Matthew. Um, it's pretty early here for me in Hawaii, so I'm not going to share my video. You'll be as scared of my appearance. Sorry. 
Um, I just kind of been thinking about this for a while, and I'm going to probably upset some people, so I'll apologize ahead of time. But I kind of like the, the four, and I don't remember the terms they use, but basically the institutional uh, level and then the internalized level. And I've been noticing teaching around the world and, and mostly to uh, underrepresented populations, be it Pacific Islander, Native American, Black, Hispanic. Um, I feel a lot of people going back to what um, was mentioned earlier about, you know, oh, the need for grades and I got to get an A and I got to do this. And I think we do a disservice and disjustice in that we tend to focus on that and I don't want to say spoon feed, but that's the best thing I can come up with this at this hour. Um, to get them to get that grade, not give away a grade, but how do we best get them there so that they can quote unquote succeed instead of making them rise to a challenge through an understanding on how they best learn from that cultural background. Um, but again, that you had mentioned something about, you know, our students are smart, you know, we just got to set and, and, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of times that doesn't get seen. And so we kind of just and I, I get in trouble from from mostly my students, you know, well, so and so does this, why don't you do this? <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> try to do something different here, you know, so but I think it is a very institutionalized and it's getting that way. And I'm noticing that in the last few years, again, traveling and, and, and living in a lot of different places where it just seems, well, let's let's give them all this information and all these things to make it as easy as possible for them to get that A as opposed to raising that bar and letting them really kind of do a bit of that work for themselves, being that they are at college and and achieving something that they may not because they have internalized, oh, I can't do this. I've never been told I can. Um, and I think we're just sort of perpetuating that uh, with the current situation. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of glad that I got brought up as well. Um, and again, I'm sure I'm upsetting people by saying this, but uh, unfortunately I have noticed it at Bipsy as well. Um, but I think it's something that we should just put on our radar as well from, from that standpoint as well. Thanks for hearing me out. Yeah, thanks. And all of us are jealous that you're in Hawaii. Um, so, you know, one of the things that you spiked out in that, Matthew, was the perspective of, you know, seeing the asset that our students bring. And this is another mindset. It's another way of thinking about what our students bring and seeing who they are as an asset to the classroom rather than as a deficit. And in many ways, most of us have been conditioned to hold deficit ideologies about everyone, whether it's about our students or our colleagues, um, because it, it's, a, it's reinforcing of the status quo. If they don't have the things that we expect, they lack those things rather than looking at them and saying, well, what do they have? What do they bring that could add value in a different way, right? And this is something I'm working on is how am I reframing the way that I look Again, it's about always about lenses. How am I looking through my lenses to see to see these individuals as whole, complete people and, and the value that they bring or the barriers that they may be facing? And what can I do to dismantle those barriers and to, to see the, the value that they bring? And that a lot of times affects how we grade and how we instruct in our classes. And so thanks for bringing that up, Matthew. Thank you for appreciate it. Uh, you're welcome to contact me. At my email, as I said in the beginning, is mp at engineeringinclusion.com. Um, I have lots of free resources on my website. If you want to um, join my mailing list, you can do that from about weekly emails um, with strategies and resources uh, that can help you in your own practice. Um, and I, I leave you with this quote. This quote is from um, Amanda Gorman and she was the poet laureate and she read her own original work at the inauguration and she ended with this. She said, there's always light if we're only brave enough to see it, if we're only brave enough to be it. And what that means to me and this work is that uh, we have to be brave enough to to adjust our lenses, whether that means taking off your rose colored glasses and putting on, you know, the new goggles that you're going to focus and learn how to see the world differently. Uh, but we've got to be brave enough to do that because sometimes in doing that, we what we definitely see things differently and we see the world through a different light.
and we see we can begin to see the barriers that other people are facing. But then most importantly, that we are brave enough to do something about it. And going back to Janetta Sagan's quote, that silence is complicity, that if we aren't brave enough to do something about the things that we see, we are complicit in upholding those systems of oppression that continue to marginalize people um, within the systems in which we function. So I'm really grateful for your time today. And again, I'm gonna stay on till 4.30. If you have any questions, I wanna make sure that I get those answered. And I see your emails in the chat and uh, we'll follow up with you. Um, I'll probably get it wrapped up this weekend uh, and sent out to everyone. And so again, thank you. Any last words, comments? Mm -hmm.